System logs and queues. So what are system logs? Well, system logs are basically files, some kind of file that stores information about events that happen. So when something happens on your system, it's usually sent to one of the many log files in the var log directory. And then those files record the events and allows you to look back and see what happened in order to lead up to certain situations you're in or to figure out what's happening in your system. So what kind of information is stored in the system logs? You have your regular messages whenever you start and stop services, that's starting there. You have logs that indicate whenever you boot up your system, what options and things happen there. You have logs that indicate um, things like mail coming in, going out. You have logs for your web services. You have logs for logging in, logging out. Um, SE Linux has a set of logs. All of these things are in the logs, in the log directory. So why do logs take up so much space? Well, logs are written anytime some major event happens. And there can be lots of different events that happen. And all these events have a line entry or more in the log files. If someone tries attacking you, you can actually fill up the entire partition that those logs are stored in because you start generating too much data and it's, well, bad. And if the logs completely fill up the system, well, it depends on where the logs are. So some people will put their logs, their var log directory or their var directory in a separate partition so that if it does fill up all the way, the system can continue to function. However, if it's not in a separate directory, then whatever directory they're, or whatever partition they're in could completely fill up and if that's your main boot, may not boot, but your main root of your system, that means your system might become difficult to use for anything. So you got to watch out for that. So who reads all these logs? Well, lots of people can read the logs. Well, some of them anyway. But there are some files that can be read only by people who have special rights. So the root user or administrators who have the ability to become root. And those logs usually have more sensitive data. The less sensitive data can be visible to all users. So why can't normal users read all the logs? Well, imagine if someone were to try logging in and so you saw a login attempt with some username and you notice that username looked very much like a password. And then right afterwards, after they failed to log in, a user logged in and they logged in with the correct password apparently, but you see their name. So then you might be able to take that password and that name and put them together to figure out what the user and password pair is. That might not be something you want normal users to be able to see. Also, um, other things, if you try doing some bad on the system, maybe you'll generate a log and you don't want that log entry to well, everyone to know what log entries were generated when people are doing bad things because then they can figure out what they can get away with without having logs generated. So it can be helpful. So let's go take a look at the log files and see what we see. So if I jump over here to the var log directory, I can see a lot of files. And there are, well, lots of them. Some of them are big, some of them are small. But let's just go through some of the main ones. So we can see that there is a D message file at the top. So if I cat out D message, D M E S G, you can see this is information about how the system started. You can see what started in what order, and that can be useful for a few things. Uh, also, you can see there is this last log. Last log is, well, let's take a look at what we can see here. Last log. It looks hard to read. So you can actually type in last and then it will tell you who's been logging in and when they've been logging in and information like that. It is a binary file. So we can look at it using that tool. You have messages. So let's cut out messages. Messages is where your default log files are for everything. You can see lots of things running through. You can scan through it and figure out what's happening if people are having login failures, um, all that information. 
Also, you have a little lower the secure log. That shows your logins attempts as well. Cat secure. You can see all of your PAM uh, Unix things, uh, which is basically your login attempts. All right. Then after you see all that, you know, there's a few other logs in there, um, but there are some directories as well. Um, so let's go look at these directories. So there is one for audit. So if you go into audit, this is where your SE Linux audit logs are. You cut out your audit file and you can see all of these SE Linux violations or passes. And you can see what succeeded, what failed. If something failed, it will tell you in here what failed. And this can be very useful for troubleshooting problems. If you're doing something on the web and the web's not working properly, you can go look at your web logs, assuming you have Apache installed and you're going to look at web logs and you can see those, but maybe it wasn't a violation there. Maybe it was an SE Linux violation. And then you can go in here and look and see, is there something showing up? All right, if I install uh, Apache, for example, I will see an HTTPD directory show up. So let's do a yum install HTTPD, just so we can see the directory. And now I can see that there is an HTTP directory that just showed up. And I can go into this directory and take a look at that. Nothing here, but then you'll see an access log and an error log whenever there are problems with your web pages. All right. So those are your log files. So what is the var log messages file for? Well, it's your standard default location for your log messages. For any log messages, if you don't have something specific, such as um, SC Linux has its own audit directory, and HTTPD or Apache has its own HTTPD directory, if it isn't one of those type of services or it doesn't have something special, it might just write it to the messages log directory, messages file. Um, can you read it in real time? Yes, you can. Um, it's not very exciting if there's something happening, but you can read it using the tail command. So let's take a look at how that works. If I wanted to look at it in real time, I can do a tail minus F messages. And you can see, I press enter a few times. That's what happened. There's nothing going on. So if I were to pull up another terminal over here and let's say, oops, I pulled up a terminal that didn't do anything. But if I were to install something, so yum install, uh, let's do and maps it is there. It's probably already here. Well, I guess not. You can see that suddenly it says, oh, installed and map. And you can see that showing up right there in the logs. If I do a yum update, which could probably be a really bad idea from the GUI, but it's nothing replacing GUI. If I do that, you can see suddenly it's showing up a whole bunch of stuff being updated. And you can see those in real time. If you're looking at the messages file with the minus F switch in the tail command. So tail minus F, the file, and you can see changes happening to that file. All right. You press control C to get out of that. Can the logs be changed? Yes, they can. I can go in there and edit the logs if I wanted to. I could delete things out of it. So if I were some kind of a hacker and I wanted to mess up your system, what I'd probably do is either edit your logs or just delete your logs altogether. So I've had hackers hack into my systems before and delete the logs. And if you notice your log directory is all empty, well, that's usually an indication that something bad happened and something got in your system. The var log secure. So var log secure, once again, I mentioned that one indicates who is logging in your system and if they are failing to log in. So what information is stored in that directory? Well, it's got attempted logins. So let's go ahead and uh, fail a couple of the logins so we can see what that looks like. So I could do a uh, tail minus F secure. 
and see where it starts. I'll pull up another terminal right here. And now I'm going to fail a few logins. So I do uh, SSH root at localhost. Yeah, sure. Password. Nope. Nope. And you can see that it is failing to log in. And then you can look at this and say, well, what happened? Well, you can see failed password for root, and it says where I logged in from. So it's actually saying, well, I should use IPv6 logged in locally. Okay, from localhost. That's fine. But if you see it from a different IP address, what tends to happen is there are a lot of script kitties out on the internet, and they are using these um, lists of passwords, and they'll just sit there and guess your passwords. And, well, I'll try to guess your password. And they grab all the common passwords, and if one of them goes through, then you'll get it hacked into, and it'll be over. So, don't pick a commonly common bad password, or bad things can happen. So, don't do that. All right. Um, can I use the information to identify hackers? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can see that clearly I came in from colon colon one, which was my IPv6 local host. Um, can the information to identify users who are doing things, or can I identify users who are doing things they should not do? Yeah, sometimes. It depends on what you mean by identify users also. Um, sometimes they are trying to switch over to root when they're not supposed to and that could show up um, sometimes you know other things can happen but what it really tells you is what user is trying to do it or what ip address is trying to do it it doesn't tell you who the person was or where they came from can i use the information to detect system compromise well sometimes sometimes you can't sometimes all you can see is that they were attacking your system and trying to get in but that doesn't mean they got in there can I use the information to identify users who forgot their passwords? Maybe. You can see who's failing login. Does that mean they forgot their password? No. Does it mean that they're a hacker? No. It could be either one. It could be other things as well. It could be their cat jumping on the keyboard. We don't know. All you know is that someone is failing login. And that's all you see there. What does it mean to rotate logs? There is a uh, program you can install called Log Rotate. And what that does is it will take all of your log files, or many of them, and every week or whatever set period of time you want, it will rotate the logs. And what that means is it will take the existing log file and move it to a new file with a number extension. And then it will create a new file. And what happens by doing that is you can then decide how long you want to keep logs for. And if you want to just let logs disappear after a month and then your system might not run out of space and might not crash. Can the log searching process be automated? Because I can look at those logs right there. And there is a tool called LogWatch, which you can install, which will go through once a day, a little cron daily thing, scan through it and figure out if there's anything that looks suspicious, and then send you an email to let you know what things can or are bad. Can logs be stored on a different machine? Yes, they can. So your logging utility is usually your syslog, syslog program, and they're different syslog programs, but your syslog program can be configured to send your logs to a different machine, which can be useful if you want to save your logs. You can also configure your Linux machine to receive logs from other systems. So you have your Cisco routers and switches all send their logs to this machine, and you get them all consolidated in one safe location. Then if the router switches get hacked and the logs get messed up, well, they're already on this machine. They're gone. So you've got a copy and they're safe. Queues. What is a queue? Well, a queue is a line, right? It's a British word for line, kind of. You queue up and, well, that's what a queue is. So what is it on the computer? Well, the computer is basically a line. You have these things that are getting ready to do something. So you get them ready. You can have your mail queues and things of like that. So then what's a spool? Well, a spool is when you are, you think of like a spool of thread or something, things are wrapped around it. Basically, it's just kind of feeding things through something. You're spooling it through. So spooling 
your print jobs from your application to your print um, daemon, which then spools it off to your print server or to your printer, and it eventually gets printed. That's spooling, passing things through. And queues and spools can kind of be thought of as similar things. They're a little different, but they are used for the same kind of purposes. So what queues are used on a Linux system? Well, let's take a look. So I clear my screen there, jump down to the bar, and there is a bar spool directory. In this bar spool directory, you can see a couple different things. We can see var spool postfix, var spool mail, var spool cups, var spool LPD, var spool cron, like lots of different things. So postfix is my mail server. My mail directory is my, well, incoming mail. LPD and cups are both for print services. So that's kind of nice. Cron and at and anacron are all for timed task management. So, yeah, you kind of get an idea there. Um, let's take a look at the mail directory. Oops, CD mail. You can see there is a Joseph and an RPC, but Joseph is empty. <clears throat> if I were to have a mail client installed, um, I can do mail, should mail Joseph. And I can have a subject say something and say, hey, there. And I have a period by itself and close it. And then if I take a look around, uh, suddenly I see uh, Joseph got mail. So I just sent him mail and it went into this mail spool thing. So if I cut out my Joseph file, I can see all of the mail that got sent to him. So you can see who it's from, information about where it's to, subject, um, the from line, and then the contents of the email all showing up right there in this mail thing. If I send another email, it will show up in the exact same file, just added to the end. If Joseph logs in, he can then read his mail and he'll pull it out of this file and into his home directory. So that's that directory. All right, what about um, cups? You can see just temporary stuff here. LPD, you know, it's basically the same thing. They're just printing services. If I go into postfix though, you'll see something more exciting. It's got a lot of different directories. You've got the incoming, you've got the outgoing stuff, the bounce directory. Well, if you think about it, a mail server is a lot more complex than you might think. I guess if you think about it, yeah. So what happens? Well, you drop your mail into your your uh, program. This mail program, it puts things in here. It looks at them. It tries to send the mail. It receives mail. If it can send mail, it sends it. If it can't send it, it might have to sit there and defer it or bounce it or something else. It depends on what's going on. And so this keeps track of every single piece of mail and what state it is going through this mail system. So that can be useful. So let's jump back over here. So where is incoming mail stored? Where well, we just looked. It's in the var spool. And then you have to decide which one you're looking at. What do you mean incoming? Is it incoming that's already arrived or incoming that's incoming? If it's incoming, it be in the postfix directory if it's using postfix. And outgoing would be in postfix as well. So var spool postfix. But once it has gone through postfix and been processed, it'll get put into var spool mail. Why do I care about mail? Well, lots of different tasks and things on the system will use mail as a way to communicate with the users. So Whenever you have cron jobs that produce output, it creates mail. Whenever you have log rotate, mail not log rotate, but log watch, per, looking at the, the logs and finding problems, it'll report these log errors or these suspicious behaviors and things you can see to your mailbox. So you can look at it. 
Why is mail stored in queues? Well, it has to do a lot of waiting and moving. And so you really need it in queues. Where are the print jobs stored? Well, they're stored in that spool directory, right? The var spool uh, cups is our print server. Um, right now, I don't have the print server configured for any printers. But if it were, you might see some stuff in there. And if I was sending print jobs through, you'd probably see that as well. So why are print jobs put in a queue? Well, printers don't always have enough space for all the print jobs that they receive all at once. And so you send it to a queue, and the spool queue slowly feeds it off to the printer as the printer is ready for another job. So that can be important. Make sure that you don't lose jobs. Otherwise, if you send too many jobs and it can't hold them all, they get lost. So that's why it's important. And that's our little quick thing on um, system logs and queues.